Welcome to PsyCow. I'm Kyle. And I'm Stacy. And this week we have JT Petty, director of The Burrows, Sandman, all kinds of good stuff. I think the first movie I saw was Sandman, and I it like really, really got me. I thought it was something. I thought that dude was for real, but he wasn't for real. He wasn't but for I, real. It come, wasn't. Come real. on, Eric, the, the the chubby guy. Yeah. If you look on his Facebook, it actually says, um, "I'm not a killer." <laughs> Oh, really? Which to me, that make that means you are a killer. Because I wouldn't, you know, if I was a killer, I wouldn't put that on my Facebook. I'm not a killer. Right. But yeah, so good thing that JT clears that up for us. So let's <laughs> before we ruin too much. I mean, we're already fucking ruining the interview. Let's jump right into the interview with JT Petty. So what got you into making horror films? Um, I don't know. I mean, I always wanted to make movies. Uh, I, I guess there was a little bit of my childhood where I wanted to be an air traffic controller, but but. Pretty early on, I decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, and then outside of that, I don't know. I didn't even think I was really making horror movies, but uh, they tended to have monsters in them. Right, because Saw for Digging was your first film. And, and really, I don't consider that a horror movie. I, I, I consider that kind of a, an artistic thriller, I guess. Yeah. I mean, what was most important to me about that movie was that there's no dialogue in it. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty classical ghost story, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um where, where did the idea come from? Because I know it got a lot of notoriety at festivals like Sundance. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the idea came from just making it, uh, you know, without any dialogue. Um, I do remember there's this old uh, Pogue song about Shane McGowan being on a boat that goes down and the captain doesn't go down with the ship. Right. But no, the captain the captain dies and then I think he jumps on Shane's back and he's got to carry him across Ireland and deliver him to the guy who, like, paid for the voyage just to be like, fuck you for killing us all. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I love that idea. Of, I think it was almost just that image of like actually physically having a ghost hanging onto your neck. And then, and then it's like such a little kid kind of image, right? Like, a, like I've got a three year old girl now. It's like one of her favorite things is to pretend she's a cape. Right. Um, and so, so that sort of became the old guy with a dead girl on his back. <laughs> and uh, then everything sort of came from there. And it was only six hundred hours for the whole shoot. That's pretty amazing. Oh, six thousand. Oh, six thousand. Okay, we were reading uh, online. I was going to say six hundred hours is like insane. That is <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, it was six thousand, and those were, you know, those were uh, whatever, like nineteen ninety seven dollars. So right, right. <laughs> stretching. But yeah, I mean, that's um, shooting on sixteen millimeter, and and I was in school, so I could get a bunch of stuff for free and all that sort of stuff. So right, that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Do it while you're young. What, uh, you did also one of the Mimic sequels. Uh, is there anything in particular that drew you to the Mimic franchise? Um, I mean, to be totally honest, uh, basically I saw, uh, met a producer from Dimension at Sundance and I was still working my day job at the time. And he asked me to come into, to Miramax and sort of talk about some projects that they had. Um, and they essentially just laid out every sequel they were going to make that year. You know, so they, they literally said, like, you know, we're going to make Hellbender or uh, uh, Hellraiser 8 and 9, we're going to make Children of the Corn 10, we're going to make The Crow 6, we're going to make The Prophecy 5, and we're going to make Mimic wow. 3. And, and I chose Mimic because they had a pretty strong concept for it, and it was the lowest number in terms of sequels. Right. right. Is, uh, was Lance Hendrickson originally written in? For Mimic, or was that somebody you just were lucky to get? No, he came on. He came on pretty late in casting. Um, but yeah, it was just just lucky to get him. I mean, he's obviously like the icon of my childhood. I mean, I grew up watching Aliens probably three times a week. Definitely. So just, you know, he's he was, was amazing. He's so he's pretty great to work with. Yeah, he was funny. I mean, like he was. Uh, uh, like every actor on that, that movie was so completely different. You know, like, like, uh, um, it was Amanda Plummer and Lance Henriksen and Carl Geary and Alexis Sienna. And they were all just like at completely different parts in their career. And it was such an amazing kind of crash course in how to deal with actors. Right. Um, and what was, what was funniest about Lance was like how, how different he was from on screen to in person. Like you see him in person and, and he's this guy and he's, you know, he's like a, a symmetrical looking guy. Like you'd see him at the DMV and you wouldn't really think twice about him. 
<laughs> and I could like lean over from him to the video monitor and he suddenly becomes Lance Henriksen. You know, something like <laughs> his face is made out of leather. He's got these crazy eyes and like is, is, is that guy I was so familiar with. <clears throat> right. That was sort of a lot of the lesson too, is just like trusting the camera to see things that I couldn't. Like you said, Lance is definitely an icon because I, and just like you, Aliens was a huge part of my childhood, especially Alien, well, the second one, but because uh, the third one I wasn't too into. But with Mimic, I, I remember seeing Mimic, the the first one as a kid, and I didn't really know there were sequels until later. And when I, I knew there were, I had to watch them just because I was a huge fan as a kid. Because um, those are my kind of movies, the cool different monsters and that kind of thing. And, and I, sure. was, I was surprised because normally sequels are, are not as good as the original, but I really did enjoy the third one. The Sentinel was really, really well done. Oh, thank you. But I'm also a huge Batman fan. Like I'm, I'm gay for Batman. And um, <laughs> uh, I saw that you wrote scripts for uh, Batman: Vengeance and Batman Begins, the video games. Uh, what was it like writing for Batman? Did you get to meet a lot of uh, the <clears throat> cast? Uh, yeah. I mean, Batman Begins. I got to direct the whole cast. So um, when they came in to do the voice work, I got to direct, you know, Vale and and uh, uh, Michael Caine and Liam Neeson and all those people. And that was that was amazing. Um. I mean, Batman Vengeance is probably a little bit more fun to write because there was no story there. You know, they had just bought the license and we actually had, uh, you know, a decent production run to actually make that game. Right. Um, you know, something like Batman Begins, there was a lot of pretty amazing stuff about it because we did actually work pretty closely with, with Nolan's crew to sort of make that game. You know, I mean, a lot of the, the, at least the, the cutscene production worked out of Nolan's offices in London. Right. Um, and working with the cast was great. But obviously there's sort of limitations in, in terms of what you can do story-wise because we had to stick with basically the movie story. Right. And and a lot of it was about like trying to find places that we could kind of fill in the gaps and talk about uh, some other stuff. And I like I got to meet Denny O'Neill on that, who was working on the novelization at the time. And it sounds like you guys are pretty young guys, but I mean, Denny O'Neill sort of like ran Batman, you know, in the, the 1970s. Right. Uh, you know, and sort of like the last years of Batman being in blue and gray, um, you know, invented Ra's al Ghul. And it was just this like kind of awesome old guy who had all these stories about DC Comics in the 70s and 80s. God, that's awesome. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's sad how obsessed I am with the Batman franchise. Not just the movies, but I mean, I'm a huge comic book nerd, too. And I hate, I mean, it, it's, I guess it's more accepted today, but um, <laughs> with all the movies. But um for sure. I thought that was awesome that I saw that with Batman. I had to bring it up. Even though we do horror movie shows, I was like, oh, I got to talk about Batman. <laughs> um, no, just, just like somebody, somebody trusting me to like play with Batman for, right. for even a video game is just like such, yeah, like honor is probably too strong a word, but I, I certainly felt a lot of responsibility there. Right. Well, um, jumping back into horror, um, I think the first thing that I ever saw, um, I, I did see Saw for Digging uh, randomly. I didn't, I wasn't sure what it was, but I, I'm a huge fan of just checking out indie films. And then I noticed uh, on Netflix that I saw the Sandman movie, the documentary. Um, how real was the interaction between you and Eric uh, Ross? I think his last name is Ross, but I, I, some, something else kept coming up online where his last name starts with an M. But how yeah, real was that? that? Yeah. How, how real was the interaction between you and him? Was that all genuine or was some of it kind of scripted or... Uh, yeah, I mean, almost entirely scripted. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, I mean, he's, his character is bullshit, and, yeah. and that was sort of part of the idea. Um, and, and we, we built him as entirely as we could. You know, like, like before we even started the documentary segments, we made the Sandman movies and took them to festivals and, or the, the conventions and sold them. Right. Um, so I mean, he's, he's invented, but, um, you know, at the same time, like, Beelzebub wasn't born Beelzebub. You know, there's, there's yeah. a point in his life where he decided to create Beelzebub and went out to conventions and started to, to sell things. And, like, when I first met Fred Vogel, uh, he told me his name was Fred and Stein. Um, <laughs> so, and you, you talk to those guys, right? Uh, uh, we passes. talked to Bill. We haven't talked to Fred yet. He's he's up uh, next, actually. <clears throat> oh, okay, cool. I wonder, we should have asked what Bill's name is for real. That should have been our first question. <laughs> You know, it does. He it does say Bill's above on his driver's license, so I think he's he's had it changed. Yeah, that's oh. what I noticed. That he even said in the documentary he can actually sign checks with the name Bill's above. I'm just like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, with the Sandman movie. Did you ask Bill movie, about Sandman? I'm sorry. Did you ask Bill about Sandman? Yeah, he. Uh, we asked him kind of the same question, and he just told us that he pretty much told us that uh, his uh, his interviews and Fred's interviews were as genuine as you know, talking with uh, us right now. 
Um, <laughs> so well, Bill was he was real though, right? Was that anything scripted, or I mean, because I'm Bill's kind of a crazy guy and he's very long winded. Um, and I, I'm sure you had to cut a lot of his interview. <laughs> he had us on for two and a half hours, which, you know, I'm not complaining. I love talking. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. No, like, like Bill, Bill was certainly not scripted, but, but he's loquacious enough that you could cut together any story you wanted from, you know, the eight hours of him talking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he definitely is opinionated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, jumping back into the Sandman, what made you decide to put more of a fake character in with the, with the real guys because when i watched it i was definitely like i was into it and i was like oh man like this guy like it's kind of weird like what's creepy going, yeah what's going on with this guy and then looking into it i was like oh it makes sense but at the same time it gave me that feeling of like well i watch all these august undergrounds and i watch bills above movies like am i wrong for watching that because i feel like that guy was so like he was videotaping stuff to be creepy so right. what, made you, what made you decide to go that route for having like a fictional character in there? Um, I mean, a, a lot of the original ideas about it were, were kind of that line between what's real and what's not. I mean, certainly, certainly like you're always like playing with the tension in a horror film of how close to realistic you can get. And you watch something like uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, where where he's like bending over backwards to make it as, as sort of non-narrative and realistic as possible. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, it still has that sort of titillation of a horror film, but almost takes it too far for a lot of people where they, they lose the enjoyment of it. Um, right. And the question of how realistic you can go and still enjoy it, I think is a really interesting one for, for both horror film watchers and horror makers. Um, and so, so having a character who was sort of fictional and who I could control like that sort of let me play a lot more explicitly with the line between what's real and what's not. Um, I mean, like what, one of the most disturbing moments in the movie for me, uh, is actually that, that bit where Bill's above slices up his own arm. Right. It's yeah. Not that he's really slicing up his arm. Um, that's and, something else that we asked him about too, I think, cause he, he said that he had made that movie before he saw August underground, but, uh, in the documentary, it was it was after August Underground. Yeah, well, I'm lying all over that documentary. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I love it though. I mean, that's what you got to uh, do to make a good movie. <laughs> well, but but it's also sort of the point of the movie. I yeah. mean, like I I was I was definitely like trying to make myself as much of an asshole as possible in that movie, right? So right. That you wouldn't trust me as the director or or you know my involvement in editing, right? And, right. and it's so explicitly manipulative in terms of editing. You know, where, where I'm, I'm sort of cutting from one interview to the next in a way that completely changes the meaning of, of what people are doing. You know, there's a point where the, the, the forensic psychiatrists laugh at Debbie D for thinking she's going to be a superstar someday. <laughs> right. It's, like, it's like such a dick move. <laughs> like, like, obviously they weren't laughing at her, but everybody in the audience gets uncomfortable. It's like, oh, Jesus, it's terrible. Right. Um, and, and, and I really like, I'm, I'm always so skeptical watching documentaries because I mean, they are so like, there's a lot of bullshit in Sandman, but, but I hope that it's explicit. Right. Whereas there's so much bullshit in March of the Penguins, but we're supposed to take it seriously. That's yeah. Every documentary, I'm a huge documentary fan, but you, you can easily point out a lot of times that's total bullshit, you know? Yeah. Um, wh- how about the beginning of the movie where you said that your initial, uh, your point for the documentary was to film, um, it, what, what, he was a, a, well, I guess a sadist, I guess, a little bit, or a masochist, but uh, he was uh, vid- videotaping other people. Was that a true story, or was that, that complete bullshit, too? Yeah, no, that was totally true. Oh, And actually, wow. even the bit about, like, him, him he, when I finally saw him face-to-face, he was going at a stump in his yard with a chainsaw. Oh, wow. See, that would be the part that I thought would be bullshit, and the rest of them like, oh, he's not lying to me. I can do all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what was it like being on set for Bill's film? Because he looked like he was uh, a little out of it. He said he was, had heat exhaust, exhaustion on that uh, set. Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to tell with Bill. Like, I mean, it was, it, was, it was amazingly fun on the set, and it was actually great talking to everybody who worked with Bill that, you know, like, like that, the, the shoot, you know, we were there for, you know, 10 hours, and he got maybe four shots. Um, 
And you know that that poor girl's like lying on her stomach the whole time, right? With these giant fake tits, and it's just like I'm sure it's terrible <laughs> lying on top. Of yeah, that's you know, what he like, was saying. He hated that shit. He hated fake tits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure for entirely, uh, you know, uh, feminist reasons. But um, <laughs> but but so so despite like how hard it was for everybody, everybody talked about how much they loved Bill and loved working with Bill. Um. But he was definitely like, I, I think there was some performance anxiety on his part and, right. and certainly a fair amount of drinking going on. Um, but I mean, who knows about, I've heard heat exhaustion from Bill. I've heard uh, diabetes. Or, yeah, it's just like all sorts. It, it, it's always a story and an, another half hour of it. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on some of like the Bill Zubub and the Fred Vogel? I know it's kind of like an underground tech, technically considered like underground, uh, is there any films out there that you find completely shocking? Um, I don't know. I mean, shock's a funny thing. I mean, cause, cause I sort of, I get, I get my guard up anyway when I'm watching a, a one of Fred's movies and, um, Bill's movies are so sort of playful. It's hard to be shocked by them. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, they're, they're kind of Saturday morning cartoons in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, like, I, I, I was actually a, a couple of weeks ago, finally put in uh, Ant Farm Dickhole. Yeah. Um, and have you guys watched that one yet? Yeah, he gave me a copy at the horror convention in Charlotte. It's, I, I know, it's just funny. It's like, it, it feels like the more he makes these movies, the closer they get to like Louis C.K. episodes. Right. Um, I mean, it wasn't like terrible, but I, I thought it was, it was really long for a, a, a horror movie, especially sure. with, you know, ants in your dick. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't his, wasn't his best film. Um, I like some of his, uh, I mean, I like his comedy, but I guess every, all of his movies are comedy. I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah, well, there's some where he goes kind of grim. I mean, right. also the, the rape stuff uh, is, is fairly, and, yeah. and that mostly sort of gets tedious for me. Like, it seems the most explicitly made for masturbation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with, with uh, I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's funny, like, trying to find something that shocks you. Because it is it is hard, especially in the lower budget stuff, not to be uh, sort of sort of conscious of the performances or conscious of the production values or whatever. Um, but it's hard to say. I can't think of the last time I was I was really. I mean, I guess there's there's some segments in ABCs of Death where I was just like, oh, yeah. Jesus Christ, that's what they're doing. Have you seen Cerebin uh, film? No, I haven't seen that one yet. That one, like like you said, I don't get shocked uh, really at all in that movie. I've never watched a movie with my hands over my face. <laughs> just uh, like, what the fuck am I watching? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Did you, did you enjoy it? Uh, it wasn't a bad movie, it, but it was just like, it's really, it's, I feel like it was made just to, for people to go, what the Shut fuck? This guy, th yeah, this guy's fucked up. Like, it, it, but it wasn't terrible. I mean, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just like really, really, really fun. It was like infant rape and there's like all kinds of shit in that movie. Like August That's Underground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh? Would you ever watch it again? Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm a huge fan of gore and guts and like we were just talking today. We we were talking about how some of the the snuff videos on the internet. Like when I hear about it, I can't help. I know it's terrible, but I I can't help but have to go look it up because I guess it's just the horror in me. And those are something like it's like Fred said in the documentary. When you watch them, uh, it seems fake. Like just the the production, I guess, and like. I, I don't really picture the human body doing some of the stuff it does, doing you know some of the things that it does, but sure. the movies always seem a little more real. Especially I, August Underground, definitely they they pull no punches. They 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 know special effects. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I mean those the, uh, the first one and Mortem. I mean are, are sort of very right. very pure. Yeah, Mortem didn't really give a shit how you felt about it. It was just like yeah. they're gonna do whatever the fuck they want in that movie. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's sort of like the most interesting shots in that movie to me is the stuff where like they're driving past a fast food restaurant and he tilts the camera down and films one of his testicles for a few seconds. Right. Yeah. Or just right. filming dog shit and like just random shit. But I mean, and I understand where they're coming from. You know, it's they're in control of the movie and you're going to watch whatever they want you to watch. And I mean, yeah. it's just the whole, you know, control thing. But I mean, they're, those movies are hard to watch sometimes, especially Mortem to me, just because not really. A fan of kid rape, <laughs> even if it's yeah. even, even, uh -huh. if, <laughs> even if it's subject dead. matter. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if the kid's dead or not. I really don't. <laughs> yeah, it's also pretty pretty obviously true that even even if it's you know just a, a really well made doll, right? 
right. he's definitely having sex with it. Yeah. Like, like I don't think that part was fictional. And, and that gets into a sort of uh, how close to realistic you want to watch something. Right, and how, how weird really is that guy in real life. It's kind of funny because some of the goriest and most sadistic people in horror movies are the nicest people in real life, but there are times when you like watch a movie, you're like, oh my god, that guy really fucking kills people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so what are your thoughts on Bill's, of, uh, well, I already talked about Bill, but uh, uh, Fred Vogel. I mean, are you a big fan of his films? Because I know, uh, I think it's Sela Torsica. I, I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. I probably yeah, Sela Torsica. Torsica, yeah. That was, a, I, I thought that was his best movie, and it was just more dialogue than anything else. But I thought that was his best. Uh, well, how do you feel about Fred? Yeah, I like Fred a lot. I mean, I, I love what he's doing, and I like his movies. And uh, Sela Torsica was the, the, the one that was sort of dead at night, right? Like, it was right. the, uh, the returning soldier. Right, the returning soldier, yeah, and he had the thing in his head, and it popped out and killed Camille Keaton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I like that a lot, um, and, and I like, um, I mean, just sort of the whole the whole feeling of, of what he's got in Pittsburgh, and, and the, the whole kind of, like, salon of horror people. Right. And the fact that he's in Pittsburgh, I mean, there's just so much horror history down there. Yeah. Um, and, and he's... He's an honestly scary guy when he's on screen. Like, like I sort of uh, envy that in, in a way that, like, he just, he just obviously, you know, I'm never the guy who's going to have the Frankenstein tattoo on my arm. Right. And Fred is totally that guy. I, it's like his promos he did. He had a little sale going on with his. Uh, I think it was like a whole. The, you can get all three of the August Underground DVDs, and like the promo was him and a friend like bashing a girl's head in with a hammer and shit. And but he just. Like, when you meet him, he is so fucking nice, but when you watch yeah. that promo, he is like, I feel like he'd kill me if I even talked to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you're right, he pull, he does pull that across really, really well. Yeah, absolutely. But while we're talking about shocking movies, um, do you think if you made um, Software Digging now, would it still get the, the critical acclaim that it did with, you know, the animals and the kids and that kind of thing dying in the movie? Because, I mean, a lot of films do that now. Do you think it would still get the the eyebrows raised, really? If you made that today, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I don't. I don't think any of the movies I've made have been necessarily all that shocking. Um, and I think a lot of it is just sort of like the, the uh, I guess, like the the framing devices of the narrative that you're putting around your movie. Um, you know, because I mean, like the 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 most middle of the road Coen Brothers movie still has just amazing violence in it, right? Um, and often even more so and more creatively done than, than stuff I see in the horror world. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think definitely a lot of the success of software digging at festivals and such was sort of the story of the movie as much as the movie itself. I mean, just the fact of how, how cheap it was and how young I was when I made it and all that kind of stuff was, was sort of an appealing package. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I mean, who knows, it seems like it's actually a really interesting time for independent horror right now. I mean, there's a lot of really great guys doing really interesting stuff. And um, software digging might not have, have had as much attention right now, just con considering the competition. Well, speaking of, of really talented other you know directors and everything, I'm a huge Ty West fan. Even though he doesn't have a bunch of films under his belt, what he does is amazing to me. I love his movies. And I was wondering um, what ties you had to House of the Devil, because I saw that you uh, had a thanks on that. I was wondering what uh, brought you to that. Oh, he came and he uh, checked out in the editing room how Jocelyn looked on camera. Right. Because uh, she was uh, acting in Burrowers. Um, so and then he knew she was in the movie when she was auditioning for House of the Devil. Uh, so he just came by and we talked about her, and I, I tried to convince him to put her in the movie. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think... I don't know if you agree or not, but I think his movies are amazing. I think it's kind of a breath of fresh air because I like how he brings the 70s vibe back. I'm a huge 70s horror fan. and Sure. He kind of brings, especially in House of the Devil um, and The Innkeepers, it was really two movies that really brought that 70s vibe back for me. Yeah, totally. He's, he's got a real Polanski thing going with how he uses the camera. It's yeah. Great. I'm, we're trying to get him on the show, but it's hard to get a hold of some people. And I know he's he's busy you know, with his budding career, I guess. Isn't he shooting something right now? He is, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I saw it on, on, I think, one of the, I, probably IMDb. I'm, I'm addicted to that website. But, yeah, he's he's working on something now. But um, you, you mentioned the Burrow was earlier. Uh, you kind of brought together two of the biggest villains in Stephen King's books to me, like Clancy Brown and Doug Hutchinson, you know, from Green Mile and uh, Shawshank. Sure. Uh, what was it like making a Western-type film and then kind of looking at, you know, behind the scenes, you know, there's cameras and that kind of stuff. I always wondered how 
directing a movie like that was, you know, making a Western and out, you're, you see the, you know, the old West in the 1800s or early 1900s. And, uh, then you're really in, you know, the two thousands. What's that like? Um, I mean, it's great fun. I love Westerns. I mean, I certainly made that movie out of love for, for Westerns just sort of as a form. Um, I'd say the, the, I mean, all of the stuff about, you know, like researching that time period and trying to make sure we can get as much of that as possible, um, which is great fun because it is like such an overly uh, sort of mythical setting, but but historically so interesting. Um, and, and the thing that I kept sort of trying for in terms of the borrowers is just that like being a cowboy was about the shittiest job that you could get. Right. <laughs> like if you, if you couldn't cut it in Gangs of New York, they would buy you a train ticket and send you out west to be a cowboy. Right. And, and, and so it was a bunch of like ex convicts and ex slaves and immigrants. And, and there's all these amazing stories of, you know, a, a group of cowboys trying to do a job or trying to find somebody or something. And nobody speaks the same language because half of them were sort of fresh off the boat, you know, suddenly out in the old West. Um, and, and I just love thinking about like what, what like a, a European immigrant is going to think if he's suddenly in the middle of Arizona. I mean, it would be like being dropped on another planet, right? I mean, like, you've got buffalo and rattlesnakes and horny right. toads, and, like, the <laughs> landscape is what they actually used for other planets in the 50s for movies. Um, and I just love the idea that, like, you could introduce one more monster. It wouldn't be that far outside the experience of an immigrant. Right. I wonder where those monsters are now if they made an updated version of that movie, like, if it was, you know, present day. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, we played around with that because, you know, they'd come back every 70 years according to the mythology. Right. And I, I love the idea of, like, setting one in the, the mid-50s when they're digging the highways. Right. Um, you know, post-World War II, where there's the sort of the, the highway defense project. Um, you know, if they're digging out in the middle of the country, they could find whatever the, the giant sort of underground stuff going on. And then you could finally do part three in the modern day. Um, but that's all somewhere down the road. Who knows? But you would be interested in making those those films? Yeah, probably. I mean, uh, Lionsgate didn't do a whole bunch with the movie, and it didn't set the world on fire. So I, I, I can't imagine a bunch more burrowers are coming down the, the line. Right. <laughs> I, I thought it was cool. I enjoyed it. I like, like I said, I like a fresh monster movie. I mean, you you see the same movie done, Definitely. and that that movie that's you know a fresh idea. So I commend you for that. Or I commend you for that. But um, Hutchinson's creepy to me and everything he's in I, I i don't know it's something about him he's a, he's a good bad guy yeah Hutchinson's great i mean he and he, he's definitely got like an amazing energy to him and he yeah. was one of those guys that sort of like every time he came on set everybody was it would we, we, we just sort of you know the other actors don't don't go back and and wait like they they hang around and see what doug's gonna do yeah and, and it was always the stuff of like he could he could get into a really dark place while still believing everything that he was saying. You know, there's an amazing thing where like he finds out somebody fed his Indian. Right. You know, and it, it's the guy that he wanted to keep chained to a wheel and beating instead of giving him some food. And as he's like having this, this temper tantrum, he just literally starts crying, you know, and he's it, just like this, this like frustrated four year old child. Right. Like, somebody stole my toys. Like it's, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's really, t he gets a bad rap. I think, especially nowadays with kind of the, the shit going on with him in the tabloids or whatever, but I think he's a, he's a he's a cool guy. I mean, he's he, and he's really different in every movie he's in. Yeah, totally. I mean, you remember him from the X Files, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> I mean, even back, even with as Percy and Green Mile, and he was in I think a, a Punisher movie. Uh, I mean, but uh -huh. he's always different, and especially in the Punisher movie, he creeped me the fuck out. But uh, but like in Green Mile, you wanted to kill him. Like he was just the, <laughs> the devil. Like. There's no one worse than him. Like Hitler is right up there with him in that movie. Like to me, <laughs> it's just, yeah, totally. No, it's a, like perfect Stephen King character. Like right. that guy you just want to you just want to see burn. Yeah. You uh bring Clancy ba back as well for the film Hellbenders as well as Larry Fessenden. Uh can you tell us any more about that film? Uh yeah, I mean we showed it in Toronto and uh I think the deal's pretty much done with Lionsgate, so it should be coming out in a couple theaters and same day uh video. Awesome. Are you going to do like on demand or anything like that? Yeah, I imagine so. Um, the, the part of Lionsgate that we sold it to uh, focuses a lot on VOD. Awesome. What drew you to demons and possessions and that kind of thing? Uh, it was the basic concept, essentially. Like it, 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 it sort of 
um, the, the conceit of the movie is, is uh, like, you know, at the end of The Exorcist, uh, how Father Marin can't cast the demon out, so he invites possession into himself and then kills himself to take the devil to hell. Right. Right. Um, the church realizes that this is something that comes up all the time because it's in every truck and exorcism movie. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and so they have a team of guys who, who, if nobody else can do it, have to go and offer themselves for possession and then kill themselves to take the demon to hell. But in order to get possessed and in order to get into hell, they have to be far enough from a state of grace to deserve damnation. Ah. So they just live in this constant discipline of debauchery. And, and I sort of loved that idea of just like a group of priests who are just constantly like sinning and whoring and drinking and gambling. <laughs> and every possible to stay as dirty as possible. That but is... then every once in a while the phone rings and they have to go perform some horrible exorcism. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Definitely. And I just thought that was so funny and it would be so much fun to sort of, yeah, uh, a good opportunity for like a bunch of like really sort of out there characters. Yeah, that's the, I think that's an awesome idea because you're right. And I, I mean, they have all the billions of possession movies, it always does in the same way. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I know we talked about uh, the Batman game, and I noticed that you also uh, wrote the original uh, Splinter Cell video game, and the movie's coming out soon. Um, is it kind of cool to work on the movie? Uh, I don't know if, how, how deep you are into the movie, but, you know, 10 years later, they're making a movie for a game that you helped create. Is it kind of cool working with that? Uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it. I, I like the idea of Tom Hardy as uh, Sam Fisher. Um, uh, I'm not at all involved in the movie, as far as I can tell. At least they haven't talked to me about it yet. Um, I wrote a screenplay for it a bunch of years back when Pete Berg was doing it. Um, but I haven't been, I haven't had a hand in it for a while. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I noticed they, they credited you as a writer, and I was wondering if you had... I don't know if they if they kind of maybe brought the script in from the original video game, and that's how they got the credit there, or... No, I mean, they're all characters that I made up, so I think they got to credit me for that much. Right. Um, although I was also just a salaried employee of Ubisoft, so I can't imagine uh, I'll get any, you know, guild credit on the movie. Right. Uh, not only... Directing, but like you said, you do scripts as well. But you also take your own scripts and direct them. Do you like bringing the process of bringing your scripts to life instead of having somebody else kind of grab your script and be like, "Hey, I'll do this." Uh, yeah. I mean, being on set making movies about as much fun as anything. Um, and that's certainly a lot of the reason I write stuff. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it's just every every part of making movies is great fun. Um, a couple times I've written for for filmmakers I really liked. Like it's just been a, a great process of you know developing and figuring out all that sort of stuff. Right. Um, the only stuff I've written that's actually made it to a screen has been stuff that I directed as well, um, and that's certainly a lot more satisfying than you know the the ninety nine percent of scripts that kind of vanish into Hollywood. Right. Well, I remember um, a month or two back, I was I I've seen Sandman probably like thirteen times because when I find a documentary or anything that I like, I watch it a billion times. Um, <laughs> but huh. I remember I looked uh, I looked kind of uh, some of your information up, and I noticed um, on one of the horror forums that they were talking about you possibly remaking <laughs> the Faces of Death. Is that true? Uh, yeah, we're still working on that. One. Oh, that's cool. Um, so what made you want to think about recreating that? Uh, honestly, the producers saw Sandman um, and then came to me. Um, because they, they sort of liked how it was playing with all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and Faces of Death seemed like a, a more kind of commercial way to be dealing with a lot of the same things in Sandman. Right. And, and with, uh, uh, yeah, social networking, I think is really interesting and really scary in a lot of ways. And the way that we deal with privacy now and the way that we, uh, don't really have strangers anymore. Um, I think is, is really interesting. Um, and, and just, just stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's all stuff that makes me feel or, or seem like an old man, but like I, I cruise around Facebook too much. I just like get creeped out of shit. <laughs> I sort of like <laughs> to be about that. So would all the, uh, would you be writing all the segments or would you use any kind of real footage at all? Uh, or would it just be like the original where it's, um, everyone thought it was real and it looks so real that, but it's all just, you know, written it's funny have you actually seen the original recently i did i actually i watched it uh probably six months ago i was getting a tattoo done and we had we watched it yeah yeah <laughs> i mean it's sort of it's amazing i mean like the slaughterhouse stuff is, is upsetting and like the the uh the, the monkey autopsy stuff is absolutely uh, certainly real 
Yeah. Um, but it's amazing how fake so much of it looks now. Right, yeah. yeah. The monkey and, head was terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, um, and it's amazing remembering back. I mean, maybe maybe when you guys were kids, you're already, like, media savvy enough to see how fake it was. But, you know, when I was 13 or 14, like, that, I, I was completely convinced that was absolutely real. Right. right. And it's just now, like, even, even if I wasn't a horror nerd, I feel like I would have seen you know, Saddam Hussein die enough and all of this, this other just sort of like random death on the news that like, we're, we're just like so much more savvy about media and about violence. Right. That anybody could look at that and be like, Oh, that's fake. Yeah. Um, and that's gotta be interesting. Right. I mean, like, it's just like the fact that like more, more 12 year olds are seeing dead people on video without trying than, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, with all the videos, I mean, beheadings and all kinds of shit going yeah, on the... on the internet. Yeah. Sure. With the, with the war in Iraq, they had the beheadings or whatever. And I mean, that I, was that was one of the first things on the internet that I saw, and I was pretty young when I saw that, and I can't believe I watched it to be honest, but I did. But and I mean, I was as a kid though, I just cannot imagine being a kid and having access to the internet like they have now, because I mean, back then Porky's and stuff was like the material. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, like the, the the hardest core shit that you could see. Like you saw some tits. Like it was amazing. Yeah, it, when yeah. I saw when I found Disclosure with uh, Demi Moore. Go <laughs> There's probably like blur marks in the middle of that movie. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I read read somewhere it's either ten or twelve now is the average age that a boy sees uh, hardcore sex on video for the first time in America now. It's insane. Wow. I, I didn't even know what that was when I was like you know twelve. 13. Oh, I didn't either. And yeah, it's oh. crazy. It's crazy. And there was another one about the Guardian in in, in London uh, took a survey. And it was something like 10% of kids uh, said, this is kids under 16, said that they had met somebody online that they then, uh, or, or one of their friends was somebody that they met online first, um, which is, is just crazy interesting to me. I don't know. Like, it, it, it just like that, that kind of connection. Consequently, they also met Chris Hansen the same day. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, so what we like to do on our show is we like to ask what we call the Psych How 8, where we ask um, just a typical horror movie, you know, fan questions. Um, starting sure. with, what's the scariest movie of all time that you've ever seen? The scariest movie experience I ever had uh, was, like, back around 2001. I went to this movie theater uh, just because I had a crush on the girl at the concession stand, um, and, and they had a really good sort of selection of stuff, and I saw this movie not knowing anything about the film or the director and it was audition. Oh God. Yeah. So like, I didn't know who Mike was. I didn't know what kind of movie it was going to be. I hadn't seen a poster. I hadn't seen anything. So like, I thought it was going to be a, uh, like a, a weirdo romantic comedy that goes in strange places. And then like the back <laughs> jumps. Yeah. And I was so ready to leave that theater. <laughs> like, before Mike got big, I took probably like five different people to that movie telling them it was a weirdo romantic comedy. Just to just to watch them squirm. What part of the movie really got you? Was it the eyeballs, or was it before that, or the bag? It's the bag. The bag yeah. when she's waiting for the call. Oh my god, that movie! I, I saw that when it, probably not when it first came out, probably a couple years after, and it kind of scarred me for a little while. I was like, God, that guy was in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, they put them back together, and there are too many tongues. Too yeah. Many- <laughs> but I mean, even the end when she's torturing him, and so I was like, Jesus, this is awesome. <laughs> You know what kills me about that one is like the shittiest device in any movie ever made is it was all a dream. Right, yeah, I hate that. That one sells it so well because he wakes up and you think it's all a dream and you're like, oh, Jesus Christ, he has to be married to this woman now. Yeah. And like that's the worst possible thing that could have happened. Yeah. And and then it's almost a relief when he wakes up from that and he's like, oh, no, he's just being tortured. He's fine. Yeah, yeah I'd rather that happen. Yeah, that would be <laughs> – I'd rather just go out dying than, you know, to live the rest of my life thinking – you know, I had this nightmare about this the person that I love. That'd be terrible. Yeah. yeah. What's the best movie you've seen in the last five years? Uh, best in the last five years. I mean, the ones that really impressed me recently, uh, and this is, like, this is more like last five months. I'm, I'm terrible with time. Um, but uh, uh, I saw Ivan's Childhood for the first time, which really like sort of blew me away. And uh, I saw Tale of Two Sisters about couple weeks ago on video. Right. Um, and I thought that one was really, really pretty shockingly good. Yeah, it was. Uh, what's your favorite movie that you've worked on so far? That I worked on? Um, man, like if I, if I had to go back and watch one of my movies, which I don't really like doing, but I did probably be Burrowers. Right. Um, 
I think I think Sandman is more satisfying to me just because I, I was sort of less fucked with while making it. Like I, I think it's <laughs> it's the closest to what I was intending when I started making it. Right. You can do what you kind of wanted to do instead of having to uh, please all the suits and ties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's uh, what's the worst horror movie monster of all time? Man, is it is it the mimic cockroaches? <laughs> like, a, like a giant cockroach that kind of looks like a guy in a trench coat if you're far away and squinting. You're talking yeah. about Jeepers Creepers now? <laughs> it's a, it's a for a monster. Wasn't that Jeepers uh, Creepers as well? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's sort of like what's nice about monster movies, though, is that, like, just the fact that it's a monster is so generous and, and pleasing to me. You know, like, like it's um, even the cheesiest monster. Like, there's... There's real sort of pleasure to be had there. I mean, you can watch like Day of the Dolphin, and it's like the you know it's Flipper, but but like it. <laughs> I, I just like that they're they're getting outside of humans. Right. Uh, I I agree with that 100. percent I like for the kid in me loves the monster part, and I mean slashers are good, but I'd much rather see a monster and time with effects and all that stuff as well. I mean, even things killing and stuff like that. It might be cheesy, but it's like Toxic Avenger. I showed all my friends that, and they fell in love with it. They don't even like horror movies. It's just <clears throat> it's just terrible, but it's awesome at the same time. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, I mean, there's a sense of fun to it. And then, then like, when it actually works, and then, you know, there, there's something kind of heartbreaking about it. Like, it, it, I mean, you know, Del, Del Toro is obviously, like, the guy doing it best right now in terms of just sort of making monsters into art. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, you just go back to like creature from the black lagoon or the invisible man or any of this stuff where just like it, it, it starts to get kind of sad. It's, it's just like so much more interesting. Right. Yeah. Creature was my favorite universal horror movie. It was just, it was different because he was an, you know, already the monster. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Frankenstein was created Dracula yeah. was, everyone knows Dracula, but he was just a different monster that kind of got big, and I was happy that it got the success it did. Yeah. Um, what's your cheesy guilty pleasure movie outside of horror? Outside of horror? Right. Uh, cheesy guilty pleasure movie. Like something uh, that you're embarrassed to admit, because, I mean, we all have our movies that we're like, oh, God, I can't believe I watched that. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I don't have a real developed sense of shame. <laughs> that's a good that's very good I wish I didn't <laughs> yeah um god I don't know um I mean I, I've got a real giant soft spot for like mid 80s terrible action movies like I Come in Peace right <laughs> you know like like those sort of uh time time not time bandits but time what was the one with the motorcycle that could go through time and they chop up the guy with the helicopter blades at the end? What the hell? <laughs> yeah, it was a... Oh, God, I can picture the cover of the VHS tape, but I can't remember the name of it. But, I mean, that's sort of like the, the, the kind of shameful watching that I'll do on YouTube on my computer because you just <laughs> don't want my family to see it. Right. I think I just saw a trailer that I had never heard of for... for um, is it called Time Rider? Time Rider, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I watched the shit out of that when I was a kid. There was some movie called um, Cannibal House Moms or something like that from the 80s, and it was like just the worst movie ever, but I was like, I have to watch that. I love cheesy B-list horror movies. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, if, if uh, they were running monsters on TV right now, I would watch that religiously. Right. What do you think about all the remakes of horror movies? Do you agree with it, or are you kind of like, no, that doesn't need to be remade? Um, I, I think... I think anybody making a movie is, is a gift. Um, and you should try to find something good in it. I mean, The Fly is an awesome remake. The yeah, Fly it was. Is an awesome remake. Um, I mean, like, I, I actually, I like Verbinski's The Ring. I mean, it's uh, it's a different kind of scary from the original Japanese, but I think it does some amazing stuff in that movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's I don't know. I, I feel like the categorically shitting on any kind of a movie makes you a bad viewer. Right. And it's such an internet nerd thing to do. How about like Leatherface and Freddy who are already icons and like, it's just to me, they're just never going to add up to the original. 
And when I go into it, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awful. I don't know why I'm watching it. Even if it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre's remake in 2003 was amazing, and I ended up loving it. But at, at first, I'm just thinking, how could they remake a Leatherface movie? But it ended up being amazing. So, I mean, you're right. It, it is kind of a bullshit thing to do, but sometimes I can't help it. <laughs> like, Evil Dead looks awesome. Yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, if you already love something, like, it's you, you don't want to admit to loving something else. Like, you know, it's... Yeah. it's but, um, I don't know. I... I, I it's it's certainly hard to do, and I'm I'm usually eager enough about that kind of stuff to actually read up online. Um, but it's really I, I try as hard as I can to go in blank when I'm watching something. Right. Definitely. And thank you for being that way, because a lot of people do go online and they'll read reviews and then they'll see something that somebody said and then they'll just be like, oh, well then it's gonna suck if this happened, and they don't even really give it a chance. And I yeah. think more well, of that well, doesn't I mean, happen. You're, you're, if you're you're in that state, you're making an effort to enjoy movies less. Right. Right. It's like, why do you want to be a dick? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go fucking watch it. But yeah, because I watched the Silent Night trailer, which is you know the remake of Silent Night Deadly Night, which is one of my favorite horror movies. I'm a huge slasher fan. Sure. Um, and when I saw the trailer, I thought it looked amazing. I thought it was perfectly done. If they're gonna remake a, a Santa Claus Killer movie, that's as good as you're. He has a fucking blowtorch or flamethrower and i had a friend and he was like that looks fucking stupid i'm like what what were you expecting to you know be in that movie <laughs> it's santa killing people yeah yeah i mean it's funny just like thinking back to uh the, the internet fear before casino royale where it's right. like daniel craig is going to be the worst james bond ever yeah now he's yeah. awesome yeah, you know, well, I mean, uh, I don't they're, know. It's, they're kind of doing the same shit because they're talking about Idris Elba being the next James Bond, and I'm like, and they're all mad because he's black, and I'm like, who gives a shit what he, you know, what color he is? He's that's going to be an awesome. He's he's an awesome actor. Yeah, yeah. No, give it a chance. See how it is. What is uh, your favorite decade of horror? Uh, probably the '70s. That's a good one. Yeah, I mean, it's also just like you know, it was sort of like the. the you know, I was born in 77, so I was, it was like the stuff that was already around and, and the majority of things I saw were already classics by the time I saw them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just an amazing time for movies. I mean, the, the, the 70s in America, it was just like such a great balance between sort of the, the, the artsier stuff and, and like just getting onto the edge of the crazy commercial, everything has to be a blockbuster time of movies. Right. right. And you just get, like, such a fun balance in there. Yeah, 70s is by far the greatest decade of horror movies. I mean, it was so much going on then, and everything was different. Like you said, it, was, it wasn't, it was you know, cookie-cutter movies. Every, every Everyone had their own mind. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, also just, like, thinking about how all those filmmakers grew up. Right. I mean, like, my, my generation of filmmakers is such a collection of video store nerds whose defining decade was when Bill Clinton was president. Right. So you get like all these guys who have seen every horror movie a million times. And, and like, you know, if you've seen those movies, you can kind of call the shot sequences as they're happening, watching these movies that are only references to other movies. The guys who are making, making movies in the seventies grew up when their president was murdered. Right. And uh, one of their other presidents like apologized cried and got on a helicopter and flew away, like quit the job of the presidency. Right. And like, right. you know, MLK got killed. Like, just like, uh, Teddy Kennedy. I mean, there's just like all of this shit. They had pigs. Like it just, I'm sure it felt like the country was falling apart. And it's such a more interesting background to be making. I didn't even mention Vietnam, but obviously like that's huge. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and like to ha- go through all of that and then be making movies about horror seems so much more interesting to be like, you know, I saw everything so many times, and I can regurgitate it forwards and backwards. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, and I mean, that's when you had a lot of the exploitation films come out as well. Sure. Well, I mean, it was also a time. Have you read uh, Zyman's book, Shock Value? Hmm. Uh, no, not me. Uh, yeah, Jason Zyman wrote this book, uh, Shock Value. This is sort of like about, you know, young John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon and George Romero and... West Craven and sort of like where they were coming from when they made those movies. Right. And, and it's just like such an envious time to be working where like, you know, you can make any horror movie and it was going to show in Times Square, Hollywood. And, and if people liked it, it would roll out from there. You know, you didn't, you didn't have to have your quadrants figured out and your marketing budget higher than your production budget. Right. Um, 
So, I mean, it just, it, it seems so obvious, like how much great stuff would come out of that. I mean, even movies like Cannibal Holocaust and I Spit on Your Grave, even though some people look at them like, you know, exploitation films, which I guess they are in a way, but sure. they're still just amazing parts of cinema history to me. I mean, those films are, uh, those two in particular are crucial stepping stones in my horror fandom. <laughs> I sure. mean, when I saw those movies, like my whole reality changed. Like, you can make a movie about, you know, cannibalism that actually does happen in the Amazon and people consider that like an Amazon, you know, an actual horror movie. That doesn't make sense to me, but it was just to make, I mean, something as simple as a girl getting raped five times and then her killing them. I mean, that's the whole plot of the movie of I yeah. in your grave, but it ended up being one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so the, yeah, um, it's a, it's a weird one. I mean, it's definitely like, if, if you want to get into issues of like sympathy and sadism, watching right. spit on your grave, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an odd one. Oh, the last question we have for you is, uh, what's something that you learn from horror films that you kind of st you stick to with, with real life? Like, I won't ever go caving, because I saw The Descent and it freaked me out. Yeah, The Descent was good. <laughs> Everyone uh, says that every time. I shouldn't I shouldn't bring that up anymore. Everyone says that. <laughs> says that it's good? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's an amazing movie, but I, I always put that that movie in people's heads first. I shouldn't do that. I should just let you think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Most of my experience... Uh, you know, like everything somebody does in a horror movie that's stupid and gets them killed, I I I, I always do in real life. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm the first guy to walk into the woods. I'm the first one to check the basement. Like I I, <laughs> I love that shit. You know, see some creepy old house. It's like, hey, wife, let's go up and fool around. Um, <laughs> so I I don't know. Um, so you're saying you're the guy that dies in the opening credits. I, I'm the blackest man in every. <laughs> I guess the alien taught me to avoid pregnancy. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. We had so much fun with you this, uh, tonight. Yeah, it was fun talking. first movie I saw was Sandman and I it like really really got me I thought it was something I thought that dude was for real but he wasn't for real he wasn't I, real it come, wasn't come real. on Eric the, the the chubby guy yeah if you look on his Facebook it actually says um I'm not a killer <laughs> oh really <laughs> which to me that make that means you are a killer because I wouldn't you know if I was a killer I wouldn't put that on my Facebook I'm not a killer right but yeah, so good thing that JT clears that up for us. So let's before <laughs> ruin too much. Of the, I mean, we're already fucking ruining the interview. Let's jump right into the interview with JT Petty. So what got you into making horror films? Um, I don't know. I mean, I always wanted to make movies. Uh, I, I guess there was a little bit of my childhood where I wanted to be an air traffic controller, but but pretty early on, I decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, and then outside of that, I don't know. I didn't even think I was really making horror movies, but uh, they tended to have monsters in. Right, because Saw for Digging was your first film, and, and really, I don't consider that a horror movie. I, I, I consider that kind of a, an artistic thriller, I guess. Yeah, I mean, what was most important to me about that movie was that there's no dialogue in it. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty classical ghost story, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, where, where did the idea come from? Because I know it got a lot of notoriety at festivals like Sundance. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the idea came from just making it, uh, you know, without any dialogue. Um I do remember there's this old uh, Pogue song about Shane McGowan being on a boat that goes down, and the captain doesn't go down with the ship. Right. But no, the captain the captain dies, and then I think he jumps on Shane's back, and he's got to carry him across Ireland and deliver him to the guy who like paid for the voyage, just to be like, "Fuck you for killing us all." Right. <laughs> um, and I love that idea. Of, I think it was almost just that image of like actually physically having a ghost hanging onto your neck, and then, and then it's like such a little kid kind of image, right? Like, a, like I've got a three-year-old girl now. It's like one of her favorite things is to pretend she's a cape.
welcome to SciCow. I'm Kyle. And I'm Stacy. And this week we have JT Petty, director of The Burrows, Sandman, all kinds of good stuff. I think the Miramax is sort of talk about some projects that they had. Um, and they essentially just laid out every sequel they were going to make that year. You know, so they, they literally said, like, you know, we're going to make Hellbender or uh, uh, Hellraiser 8 and 9. We're going to make Children of the Corn 10. We're going to make The Crow 6. We're going to make The Prophecy 5. And we're going to make Mimic wow. 3. And, and I chose Mimic because they had a pretty strong concept for it. And it was the lowest number in terms of sequels. Right. right. Is, uh, was Lance Hendrickson originally written in for Mimic? Or was that somebody you just... We're lucky to get. No, he came on. He came on pretty late in casting. Um, but yeah, it was just just lucky to get. I mean, he's obviously like the icon of my childhood. I mean, I grew up watching Aliens probably three times a week. Definitely. So, just, you know, he's he was amazing. He's so he's pretty great to work with. Yeah, he was funny. I mean, like he was. Uh, uh, um, right. and so so that sort of became the old guy with a dead girl on his back. <laughs> and uh, then everything sort of came from there. And it was only $600 for the whole shoot? That's pretty amazing. Oh, 6000 Oh, 6000 Okay, we were reading uh, online. I was going to say $600 is, like, insane. That is <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, it was 6000 and those were, you know, those were, uh, whatever, like $1997. So right, right. <laughs> stretch them. But, yeah, I mean, that's... Um, Shooting on 16 millimeter, and and I was in school, so I could get a bunch of stuff for free and all that sort of stuff. So right, that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, do it while you're young. What uh, you did also one of the mimic sequels. Uh, is there anything in particular that drew you to the mimic franchise? Um, I mean to be totally honest, uh, basically I saw uh, met a producer from Dimension at Sundance, and I was still working my day job at the time. And he asked me to come in to, to 